I think people underestimate that because they tend to think that they just want to own something like gold or something that they know won't change. And there's certainly a place in your portfolio for those kinds of assets. But I don't think you want to underestimate the, the ability of a really good business to navigate its way through difficult times. I mean, Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Clay Fink. And today I'm very happy because I'm joined by Chris Mayer. Chris, thank you for joining me today. Hey, good to be on with you, Clay. So I read through your book, 100 Baggers, for probably the third or fourth time in preparation for this interview. (laughs) And it's definitely one of my go-tos when figuring out, you know, the types of things I want to look for when purchasing a company. I'm I call myself more so like a quality investor. I want to buy a higher quality company, um, kind of what Warren Buffett's preached more and more nowadays. Maybe we could get this conversation kicked off by um, maybe just having you just tell us what a hundred bagger is and what brought you to writing a book on them. Yeah. So a hundred bagger is a stock that goes up a hundred to one. So you put a dollar and you get a hundred back. How I got into it? Well, that's... uh... That's interesting. I mean, I it started with Chuck Ockray really in 2011. And he gave a talk called Investor's Odyssey. You can find it online. So uh, definitely recommend it. It's a great talk. And in that talk, he mentions a book by Thomas Phelps called 100 to 1 in the Stock Market. And uh, I was an investing junkie. You know, I thought I had read every kind of investing book out there, all the obscure ones too. And I'd never heard of that one. So I, I got it and I, you know, I really loved it. And, uh, I started quoting from it and, and this was back when I was running my newsletter. I had a, re- a reader say, you know, you should update that book. So I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. So that's how it really got started. I started to put together the research of, on my own and to update Phelps's study, but that's what really in- inspired me. Hmm. It is kind of funny that you come across some of your best ideas, um, from the outside. It just kind of serendipitously happens to you and then you're like hey, yeah why why didn't i ever think of that yeah, so, serendipity uh, is a powerful thing man I, it's one it's one of my favorite words serendipity it's uh, yeah I never underestimate <laughs> so tell us some of the key characteristics you found in studying the hunter baggers i know you put a lot of money into updating the study yeah. to put together the new list of companies that achieved the hunter bagger status so what were some of the key characteristics you found yeah well, I mean, the, the list that I created too, I sort of, you know, called it a little bit. So it, I took out a lot of the little tiny, little micro cap, micro cap flares, like, you know, if some little mining stock went from five cents to five bucks or something, that, that kind of stuff didn't make it. Um, because I was trying to kind of grapple with the idea that you might be able to see these in the numbers, you know, you, you can't really predict if a, a mining company is going to hit it big or some small little, biotech company is going to have a big drug that mm-hmm. suddenly, you know, goes up hundreds of percent. We've all seen those happen. So I was trying to find, see if there were some predictable ones. And, you know, I guess I was a little bit, I didn't find as much as I thought I would as far as this kind of like a statistical profile, which I kind of hoped I might get more at, but because the path up the mountain is so varied I and mean, there's so many different ways. But if I had to like pick a few things, I would say, Almost all the stocks, all these stocks, you know, took a long time to get there. Like if there's kind of like, imagine a fat mm-hmm. tail, like most of them were 20, 25 years it took to get there and, and to do that. So you have to compound capital at 20, 25% a year for 20, 25 years. And that gets you your hundred bagger. That's basically the math of it. So that kind mm-hmm. of frames it and everything else is, is kind of backing into how do you get that? How do you get that? So, uh, that's the most important. And I, I would say. Um, you know, that means that you have to have companies that grow a lot, right? So McDonald's of the world's and the Home Depot's that just, just expanded and had the world as their, you know, market. I mean, those, those are the ones you, that, that kind of stand out. That's definitely one of those traits, the ability to just really grow, 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 high returns on capital, Mm -hmm. long period of time. Obviously companies that did this also had, usually had some sort of moat, had something that they did that was difficult to copy. And then another one that I like that I'm more sensitive to because I'm, I'm, I've integrated this in my own investing process and that's it, that they have some sort of entrepreneur or somebody behind it. So there's a number of like, you know, Charles Schwab, you got Charles Schwab, right? Mm-hmm. And Steve Jobs behind Apple. I mean, the, there's always, not always, but there was often an individual, an entrepreneur 
some driving force that really got it going and that was important to the, mm -hmm. the name. And there are exceptions to that, but those are some. Yeah. And then the biggest one of every study was um, TIP's favorite, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. I think at the time you wrote the book, it was an 18,000 bagger, yeah. um, which just mind numbing returns when you think about yeah. it and look at his track record versus the S&P 500. Yeah, it's nuts. This is crazy. You know, as someone that's younger and is continuing to learn more and more about investing and um, listening to your past interviews, I know yeah. you talked about how you learned a lot along the way and kind of found your way to wanting to buy these higher quality companies. And I think one of the biggest struggles for me is the catch 22 of you want to own a great business, but oftentimes the market knows it's a great business and um, it's trading at a higher valuation or a higher multiple. And I think that some investors kind of struggle with that because maybe 20, 30 years ago, a lot of these higher quality companies weren't trading as a, at as higher multiples. Um, but maybe we'll see that um, kind of direction shift a little bit with higher interest rates now too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point. I mean, valuations for most of these great companies uh, were generally higher. I mean, it wasn't like, we well, all can find exceptions, right? Where, when I think like Constellation software, uh, you know, you go back to like 2015 or 16, whatever it was, I think it was, mm -hmm. they had pretty crazy low multiple earnings. You're like, what happened mm -hmm. there? Um, but that's kind of not, not very typical. Most of the time, great companies carry premiums. Um, and even then it can still work out. I mean, the, I always think of those little exercises like Terry Smith is famous for doing, you know, where he looks at a company and he, and he rolls back 20 years and, and, and shows you what you could have paid and still made and still earned whatever 10% compound yeah. return. And, and the PE multiples are always really high, you know, uh, you gotta be careful with that kind of thing. Cause you gotta be right about the business. But I've done mm -hmm. that with some of my own, own holdings. I remember uh, I did Copart and, uh, I think I looked at like, uh, it's a 10 year period where it was up 10 X, but I looked at, well, what you could have paid and you could have paid like 60 something times earnings and still made 15% compounded over that decade. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though at the time it was still trading in a premium to the, to the S and P, I think it was 20 something times, but mm -hmm. so yeah, you really gotta be, you know, right about the business. Uh, mm -hmm. and then I would say, you know, you don't, don't think of it necessarily like you only get one bite of the apple. So you buy some today and, you know, two, three years down the road, maybe you get another chance where it's, where it does get kind of cheap. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you're, if you're really especially if you're younger and you're investing in these things for the long haul you're going to get more assets as you go and you'll probably be buying them for years that's another lesson mm -hmm. with the 100 baggers is that for a lot of these stocks you could have bought them at the highest price paid for you know high, highest price they traded in any year you could have done that for years in a row and still made 100 times your money so if you're really right about the business you you have more room on valuation than you probably think Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, you really need to be right about the business. And a key piece of that is obviously what you've alluded to is the moat. Um, mm -hmm. A company needs to be able to continue to grow and continue to fend off competition and earn those high returns on capital and continue to grow earnings. Um, a, an example to nowadays, um, a stock that's kind of been punished is Alphabet. Charlie Munger said they have the strongest moat in the world um, mm -hmm. years back. and they regret missing that one. Um, and then now people are saying, you know, they have no moat. There's AI is coming in, chat GPT and all this and its capabilities. I tend to disagree with that thesis, but that's a topic for another day. How do you go about assessing the durability of a moat? Yeah, I spent a lot of time on that um, because that's, I mean, Clay, you naturally you hit it. I mean, that's the thing. If you're going to own these things for a long time and you're buying businesses that own pre, you know, earn high returns on their capital. You want to make sure they can continue to do it year after year. And, and so you have to spend a lot of time figuring out what makes it special. Why are they earning that, those high returns? So naturally excludes a lot of things that are very cyclical. You know, mm -hmm. you might have some obvious example, be say you have oil and gas company, it's earning great returns, but that's only because it's a, we're at a good spot in the oil cycle, for example, that might, might not always be the case, right? So you really have to spend time figuring out what makes it special and i don't know i mean uh there are different kind of competitive advantages 
uh, you know, network effects. We all know, we all know some of these. Um, I think of an example like, say, Copart is a name I own. I, I always mention it because it seems to be a good example of a company that has a moat, has basically one other competitor, insurance auto auctions. But its competitive advantage is really rooted in the real estate that it owns and accumulates over a long period of time. And then the network effects of having all these different buyers and sellers of, car, of salvage cars, salvage vehicles on their on their marketplace. Uh, and so that becomes very, very difficult for competitors to crack over time. So that's what you have to do. I mean, it's a case by case basis, looking at the companies and figuring out why, how is it able to earn those high returns mm -hmm. and then being convinced that they can do it for a long period of time. And it's very difficult to copy what they do. Mm -hmm. As I've, you know, learned more about how investors go about beating the market. Um, it's been a really humbling experience. Initially, you know, it's easy to believe that, you know, it's impossible to beat the market nowadays with, you know, all this information that's out there. Anyone can access it for free. You have um, all this money in Wall Street that can invest in certain resources you can't get access to. Um, the list goes on for reasons, you know, you won't yeah. be able to beat the market. And I was reading The Joys of Compounding. It's a fantastic book by Gautam Bade. And he talks about this study where they took, they looked back and they looked at, okay, here's the higher performing companies that earn high returns on capital and the lower performing companies. And what they found in that study is that the winners tended to keep on winning and the right. losers tend to keep on losing. And when you buy one of those winners at a fair price, essentially the opportunity for an individual investor like me, the opportunity is to have that long time horizon. So buying those winners and then just allowing mm -hmm. them to um, compound um, as you just, you know, sit and wait. And I think yeah. that's one of the beauties of it and something you've discovered in your research right. as well. Yes. And I don't, I don't know that you necessarily want to make like being the market your, your goal right off the bat, because it's kind of like, you know, saying you want to be happy. It, it's just not a goal you go at directly. It's kind of like, it's the end result of a good process. And, mm -hmm. um, and also you don't have to do it whole hog. If you were an individual investor, you could take some of your money, put it in an index fund and leave it there and then put some other part mm -hmm. where you're trying to, to do better than that by studying businesses and, and doing as you suggest, trying to buy the, uh, the winners in. And I definitely agree with that, that the, the winners tend to keep winning. And there's always, again, there's always exceptions, but it's easier. <laughs> uh, you know, I always think, kind of joke with the end, you're just buying, you're buying a chart that goes up and to the right. You want to keep going up to the right. Uh, but that's, that's what tends to happen. The winners do tend to keep on winning again, because they have some competitive advantage and something special. And then they keep, they do, keep doing it. So mm -hmm. all good points, I would say. Another piece I found quite interesting in your book was the focus on investing in stocks rather than other asset classes. Um, mm -hmm. Nowadays, there's a good number of people that put a lot of their wealth outside the financial system and some probably just wait and hold cash waiting for the next crash to happen, essentially trying to yeah. time the market. And you referenced the work of Barton Biggs and how he studied these different historical catastrophes, what I'll call them, and how how one preserves their wealth during times of chaos. So talk to the audience about why investing yeah. in stocks offers investors good protection against this type of calamity. Right. Yeah. I mean, Barton Biggs book was an interesting read. I think it's called War, Wealth and Wisdom. Um, and he looks at World War II and he looks at how different stocks, stock markets behave. And even through that whole calamity, if you had bought you know, U.S. stocks, you would have been, you would, you would have done okay. I don't know if I would take that too, too much to extreme. I mean, I, I think the basic idea is that you want to own something. You want to own stuff. Um, and if you own shares in a good business, a great business, uh, your odds of surviving that uh, calamity are, are probably okay. Now uh, we can come up with extreme calamities where that's not going to be the case, but mm -hmm. you know, most of things like wars and recessions and, and and those kinds of things. And just think about it. I mean, when you have a great business, you also have, uh, you have people there trying to figure it out, trying to figure mm -hmm. out the problems and, and, and keep the business going. So 
I think people underestimate that because they tend to think that they just want to own something like gold or mm -hmm. something that they know won't change. And there's certainly a place in your portfolio for those kinds of assets. But I don't think you want to underestimate that mm -hmm. the ability of a really good business to navigate its way through difficult times. I mean, just look at the 20th century is kind of a mess, but if <laughs> it's a number of stocks that did, did perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. And the result of his work, he essentially recommended putting at least 75% of your um, assets into stocks. And, yeah, you and know, that's Barton Biggs, which, you know, he was kind of a, he was kind of pessimistic in that book, right? I mean, he, mm -hmm. he, he wasn't, uh, yeah, he wasn't, he, I think he had a lot of survivalist stuff in there too. So, <laughs> and he still said 75%. And his guy is just looking at, you know, history of different markets and how they perform during very bad times. Mm -hmm. Another piece I really resonated with in your book was the focus on owner operators. I was talking with one of our founders, Stig, about a company and, you know, I was telling him all about the business, you know, how, how well the stock's done over time. And he kind of ignored what I was, you know, saying about the business. He'd like, how much stock does it do the insider zone? And it kind of just took me aback because it was, you know, pretty unrelated to what I was talking about. But I think it just hits on the point of how important um, insider ownership and owner operators is within a business. These are businesses that are heavily owned by the managers because the managers mm -hmm. ultimately decide the fate of the business. So maybe you could expand on what makes owner operator companies a ripe hunting ground mm -hmm. for investors. Yeah. I mean, the longer, the more and more I study business and the more experience I get, the more I realize that at, at bottom business is just, is about people. And I guess there are some businesses that are so great that even when they have lousy management, they can survive that for, you know, survive that. But I always think of that Buffett quote too, where he says, you know, over 10 years, a CEO determines where 60% of the capital of the business is employed, something crazy like that. So capital allocation makes a big difference. And so I always like skin in the game. There are a number of things I'd say, uh, you know, the behavior of people who own a lot of stock is just different and it especially comes out in times of crisis. So, you know, and there's different studies for this that show that they all invest and continue to invest even during down times, uh, where a more hired hand CEO might, you know, kind of pull back and he wants to preserve his reserve his job doesn't want to be called in the you know, question so i think about even specific examples uh, you know like old dominion freight lines is a business i own and they have continued to invest in opening new distribution centers even when the trucking markets are weak and where their competitors don't i remember a slide deck from one of their presentations where they show over a 10-year period of time the number of um distribution centers, how it's grown for Old Dominion, but for a lot of their competitors, it has not. So that, you know, the willingness to invest in the business, very important. Uh, there's another interesting example I mentioned, Copart, and I tweeted this out, uh, the difference between Copart and insurance auto auctions when it came to investing in the business. Uh, Copart, again, owned by Willis Johnson and Jay Adair, uh, that have quite a bit of skin in the game and they think long-term and invest long-term, whereas insurance auto auctions was owned mostly by, you know, investors. There was not an, not an entrepreneur at the heart of that one. And they were more intent on paying dividends and didn't reinvest in the business as aggressively. And so over time now you really see the difference. The market share for a copart is where they were, where they were almost equal, say, I think it was in 2016. Now it's like 60, 40 slanted for Copart. And that's not something you can easily fix because Copart has been investing every year for all those years and, you know, billions of dollars by now. And so it's very difficult to make up that ground. So those are some reasons. I think also there's other evidence that's uh, out there about families, family owned, you know, I also count families as insiders. So if you have a family owned business, they tend to, they have certain behavioral patterns that are good. So for example, they don't play that earning earnings, the quarterly earnings game. They tend not to give guidance. Uh, they tend to be less levered, less financial leverage. So 
you know, you add that all up, the incentives are just more aligned naturally when you have, when you're investing with people who have a lot of stock of their own, you, they're already on the same side as you just naturally by the fact that they own so much stock. Again, I always like to point out that there are exceptions to this and I'm sure we can all come up with <laughs> examples of businesses where the insider owned a lot and, you know, still treated minority shareholders very poorly. But by and large, when we look at the good place to fish, by and large, the populations of of insider-owned companies tend to outperform. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the joys of compounding, and he has a chapter all about incentives. And he's pulling these Buffett and Munger quotes. And yeah, you you read that chapter and you're like, just like blown away that incentives really drive so much of human behavior. If you want to understand why someone's doing what they're doing, um, it goes back to the incentives. And when someone owns a lot of stock, um, just naturally, they're going to want the shares of the stock to do well over time. And they're going to be um, more likely to think long term and make those um, conservative type decisions. Right. Yeah. I mean, my Munger's fav- uh, famous quote on that is show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and that's a big part of what I do at Woodlock House is look at the incentives and and we, you know, our portfolio is full of companies that have high insider ownership. So it's important. Mm-hmm. You mentioned Woodlock and the fund you're managing. So transitioning from your book, 100 Baggers, what were some of the key takeaways other than maybe the owner operator piece that you've implemented into your own process? Do you always try and apply this template when you're investing in a company or... Are there other sort of situations? Uh, That's that's a great question. I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, when I did the study, it definitely had an impact. I began to appreciate a lot more the compounding that these high quality companies are capable of and the results. But it took a while. I was kind of slow to go that way entirely because even when I opened my fund in 2019, I was still, I still had some positions that were like some of the parts or deep value kind of, or special situations. And it's only, you know, it's gradually over time has been pushing more and more and more to just doing the, finding some high quality companies I can just own for a long time. And so finally, you know, I'm all the way over there and a hundred percent now. And I, I'm really not interested in, you know, buying something that trading at, you know, deep discount to peers. And then you, or you play some side of, you know, catch up that's going to take place over the next year or two. And, and then you try and you do another one. So I don't do any of that now. So now I would say, yeah, I'm a hundred percent with the, uh, the outline that I put in hundred baggers. So the big ones would be focusing on that return on capital, you know, high return mm-hmm. businesses that can continue to do that for years and years. That's really the focus. And mm-hmm. um, I think maybe one difference is, you know, in the book I talk about, staying with companies that are small in market cap. And in the fund, I've kind of, I've expanded that. I mean, I have some companies that, well, they're maybe like 30 billion or now or so, although when I bought them, they were less, but still, uh, I think that would be one difference is that I'm not so much focused on market cap, but focus more on the, on the returns. I mean, I still favor smaller companies, but I think, and I don't think I'm going to, I would, and the fund, I'm going as small as I said in the book. That would be one difference. But other than that, yeah, that that book is really the laid out the principles of what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. Another aspect of a business I've really come to appreciate is the return on capital, because that's really, at the end of the day, is really going to drive your investment returns over the long run. So I'm curious if there's a certain um, figure or hurdle rate you're looking for, maybe in when you're analyzing new investments or analyzing that return on capital? Yeah, I mean, I I try to underwrite to at least 15% compounded, so double over five, quadruple over 10. And that's, you know, with what I think are reasonable assumptions for the business. And there's no special magic to it. I mean, I look at, I try to make some reasonable estimate of what return on capital is make some reasonable estimate on what the reinvestment rate is. And then, you know, you get that compounding number, see what, see what you get at the end of five and 10 years, have some multiple on that. And then what's your IRR, you know, to now. So mm-hmm. that's the way I think about it. And, um, 
I really don't get much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. One thing I really like is how transparent you are with your portfolio on Twitter. Um, I know that psychologically that can be difficult for some people to share a position they hold um, because it becomes difficult to change their mind when the facts change mm -hmm. because they've already stated they have a position in it. Could you give an example of a company you were holding that you ended up selling? And the reason I wanted to ask this is because um, you mentioned earlier, it takes a hundred bagger 20 plus years to play out and selling interrupts that process. And you have to kind of yes. start over, I guess I'll call it. Um, one famous example of selling too early is Buffett selling Disney at a split adjusted price of 31 cents. Um, he sold at a 55% gain and um, that ended up costing him billions as many know. So what's a recent example of a company you've sold and yeah. how your thesis was busted? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, I know. Uh, first to talk about the transparency thing. I think, you know, writing a newsletter for all that time that I did and being in a fishbowl that way, having portfolio just open all the time and everybody seeing every move you make. I think that was good kind of training for this because it gives me th thick skin. I really, I really don't care very much what other people think and I'm happy to change my opinion. And that's the way it goes. I mean, uh, I'll tell you one sell was, uh, well, it was the only stock I sold last year. I had one buy and one sell. So uh, I was Texas Pacific <laughs> and I had that since my fund started in 2019. I owned it. It was a good winner, big winner. Um, but I think what, uh, what thesis changed is I misread sort of the insiders there and they corporate governance like just got worse and worse and anybody can, you know, search Texas Pacific and you could find, uh, TPL as a ticker and you'll find lots about the sordid tale of what's gone on there since, uh, you know, abuses on executive pay, the way they've, uh, just a lot of things, the way they've handled their proxy with shareholders. I mean, it's a, it's a long list of things. So I couldn't take that any longer. And, uh, that, that is one that I sold. Very interesting. Um, yeah. Since we mentioned your portfolio, you have somewhere in the ballpark of 10 holdings and mm -hmm. someone in the audience on Twitter wanted me to ask, why do you feel confident running such a concentrated portfolio when yeah. unknown unknowns are always lurking? That's a good question. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it for everybody. And when you have a 10 stock portfolio, there's a lot of things that are automatically, you know, no go. So I'm, I'm not involved, you know, I'm not involved in anything that has financial leverage. Uh, I don't have any deeply cyclical businesses. All the stocks I have produce a lot of cash, high returns on capital, and have really entrenched competitive advantages. So the, the odds of a permanent impairment in any one position is very low. Um, so that's one reason. And two, you know, there's a good case for concentration. I'm sure you've seen a number of different studies and that, you know, people have something of a false view that somehow the number of stocks they own is going to save them. You know, that owning 25 is safer than owning half that number and really depends on what, what, what you own. Right. So, uh, there's a lot of different research. I forget, you know, I remember Joel Greenblatt, he said something like six to eight, you know, there's other ones that say 10 to 12, whatever the number is, the advantages of diversification roll off pretty quickly. Certainly you capture almost all of it, uh, benefits have 20, um, maybe probably at 80% or so, maybe more with, with even 10. So I'm more comfortable with that because, you know, I can, I, I get to know those businesses really well and really get to understand them deeply. You know, we talked earlier about what makes them special, why they earn those high returns on capital. And so I really dig into that. And so I'm really very comfortable owning them over a long period of time. That That's how you get, that's how I get the comfort. I did some research on your portfolio and that's when I found Constellation Software and then started researching it. Um, research, I believe 
Uh, Chuck Acre owns it. Uh, mm-hmm. Francois Rochon owns it, who's a Canadian investor. And he was actually on our podcast with William Green. And when he mentioned Constellation during that interview, and um, he talked about how the main reason he invested in the company was because of Mark Leonard, um, the company's founder and president. I'm actually releasing an episode all about Constellation um, here this weekend. Um, the episode will be released by this by the time this conversation goes out. Um, for those who not aren't familiar, um, you like many of you likely are by now. Constellation is a holding company where every year they're acquiring dozens of do- and dozens of these small software businesses, and they're just using the profits from those businesses and just renting and repeating and going out and buying more businesses. So. Francois said when he read Mark Leonard's letters, he described it as love at first sight. And <laughs> I can I can relate to it that as yeah. um, I read his letters and put together that episode. So I'd love to just get your general perspective on why Constellation yep. made the cut for you. Yeah, actually it's the same for me. I read the letters, but I'll say at first I was skeptical, uh, skeptical of it for a long time. Um, I remember thinking, you know, they can't be acquiring good companies. They're rolling up these. There's no terminal value on these things. It's got to be junky, blah, blah, blah. I remember being very skeptical of that. But then I finally did. And I don't remember what was the impetus that finally got me to sit down and actually go through his letters. But that was when it was like, wow, you know. Yeah, it definitely got my interest then. Went way up. And then I started to do a lot more work on it. I remember I tried to contact other investors on Twitter who had knew, known the name and try to you know, just kind of orient myself to what's going on there. Um, but now, yeah, it's one of my favorite holdings. I've, I've done a lot of work and I've talked to a lot of people who've worked there and uh, I think it's a supremely rational place, really driven by all the things we're talking about. I mean, return on invested capital and growth rates at the heart of the incentives there. And, um, so yeah, I, I, that's, that's the, that's the gist of it. I mean, there are a number of interesting markers, like they have the same number of shares outstanding now as they did when they were, went public. Um, just the track record of compounding free cash flow per share. The incentive system's great. Like I said, the executives there, they have to take a portion of their bonus used to buy shares. So they don't get any option grants, no freebies. Mark Leonard himself is. You know, he has kind of like a frugal personality focused on shareholders, which I think per- then permeates the rest of the organization. You know, there was that one letter where he mentions he pays up for business class out of pocket. Um, so there's all kinds of little things like that. I think it's a, re- a very special company and uh, it's, a, it's a good one to just own and, and leave alone. Did you know we have an awesome free investing newsletter in addition to this podcast? We have over 30,000 people reading the newsletter daily. So some of you are subscribed, but that's a lot fewer than the 100 million podcast downloads we've done since inception. If you're one of the 99 million people who have listened to our podcast, but haven't yet subscribed to our newsletter, join for free today by simply clicking the link here on the pop-up on your screen and then entering your email. In just five minutes a day, you can stay up to date with what's going on with your money and in the financial world. Join over 30,000 other readers now by simply clicking the link here in the pop-up on your screen and then entering your email. Was there anything interesting in particular you found in talking with people that worked there? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the how data-driven they are, how they really stick to their hurdle rates on, on these uh, acquisitions. So that definitely stood out. I mean, I remember, you know, if it's a 25% hurdle rate, if you have a deal that's 24.8, it's a no go. So it's a lot of discipline like that, that I think is admirable. And then just the M&A machine itself, you know, their ability to find new names. I mean, I think their database, from what I've heard, is over 100,000 names. So suddenly, you know, context, I think they bought a hundred. 34, something like that last year. Yeah, that's right. So suddenly, uh, in the context of over 100,000 names, maybe 134 doesn't sound so. The other thing is the, you know, the the decentralized model is really amazing. So, you know, they've got these six operating units, but a lot of the M&A is pushed 
is pushed down. So not like you have just people sitting in headquarters doing, you know, 134 deals, one every, every third day, you know, sitting there doing these, whatever it is. Uh, it's really, you know, farmed out to these six groups. And even within those groups, then there's, there's certain M and A, uh, the ability to do M and A. So it's very decentralized, which is remarkable. I felt, mm-hmm. I don't know that anyone has succeeded to quite the extent constellation has with mm-hmm. that model. Yeah. The decentralized piece is quite interesting. I can see a lot of, you know, positives from that, but one tweet I just saw the other day, um, talked about how. Um, there was issues with compensation of some of their employees. And that can be kind of one of the drawbacks with um, the decentralized piece is each of these managers and the operating groups kind of need to figure out what works for them. And if they don't get these great ideas from some of the other groups, then um, they might not move quick enough because they're, um, there might not be as much communication at times. Yeah, there's been some turnover more recently recently being said, I don't know, the last year or so. And uh, most of that has been in, yeah, like M&A teams. Uh, you know, there's a number of copycats. And if you look at them, they're ex, they're ex constellation guys. So this is a, will be interesting to see how this plays out over time. But then, you know, when I talk to people who are close to the organization or a little higher up, they will tell me that uh, the people left are, are people that, uh, I don't want to say they're fine. You know, they're okay letting them go. They're younger people. They went for money and, uh, the higher level executives are very stable. You know, you get those golden handcuffs with your shares and all that. So we will see. <laughs> um, another question related to constellation. Um, for me, it really comes back to the management team and I know they're going to be good stewards of capital. You mentioned that they aren't going to be budgeting on the hurdle rates you read the letters and you know that, um, you know, it's very evident that he doesn't want to take advantage of shareholders essentially. So I think the big if for me with Constellation is their moat and their growth runway. I know that the management team is going to do right by shareholders. They aren't going to try and take advantage of them. They're never going to budge on their hurdle rates and they're going to be um, transparent when they think the returns are going to be lower on their acquisitions going forward. So how do you assess or think about the mo in the growth runway. Is it something that's knowable? No, I mean, yeah, that's the big question. Like, if you're a constellation shareholder, is like how long they can keep going, and there must be a limit out there. It's, there's a limit out there somewhere. But the way I think of it, there's a couple of ways. One is I mentioned the hundred thousand plus in the database. I, I think there's plenty of room, and I've talked to actually some of the copycats as well. And they don't even necessarily run into each other. So it still seems like there's a lot of names. There's still a lot. Hard to believe because it's just, but there's a lot of these things out there. The world's so pretty big. It seems like it. Seems like it. So that's that's one. And then the other way I think of it is that, you know, if I want anybody on the planet to be thinking about how to deploy capital, it would be Mark Leonard and his team, right? So they have a feeling they're going to come up with some interesting things to do. I mean, they have other avenues. We saw the way they did the All Scripts deal. We saw how they did the spinoff with Topicus. They're doing another one. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I've heard, you know, they could go into horizontal market software. They could go into another vertical. I mean, I just think that they, I have a great deal of confidence in them, and I think they'll be able to, figure out interesting things to do. And if not, then I think they will return the capital and that will be, I mean, at some point that will happen, right? There will be, you can't grow to the sky. But you also remember, you know, people said the same thing about Berkshire for a lot of years and just kept going and going and going. So um, I suspect we have a lot, a lot of time left on population. Your fund also holds Topicus, which you just mentioned, which is a spinoff of Constellation. I think I read somewhere that Topicus is around what Constellation was in 2010, 2011 in terms of their size. So yeah. do you view them any differently? Um, you know, just as highly capable of a management team, just probably uh, more room to grow. Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I think that's about right. I mean, they're focused more on Europe and Europe is a little less competitive than North America. Uh, and Topicus has some advantages there being in those individual markets, uh, having local people there that, 
speak the language, know the rules. Um, so I think, uh, I think Topicus will be a good one. I think it's very much like a mini constellation. Since you wrote a book on 100 baggers, I think everyone wants to know um, what the next 100 bagger will be. Um, yeah. So maybe I'll just throw that question over to you. What company <laughs> you think will no. be? Yeah, I'm not going to put, I'm not putting that burden on any company. That's for sure. Uh, I'm not going to take that one. Um, maybe you could share uh, one of your higher conviction holdings. Well, you know, I only have like 10 names, so I pretty much... They're all pretty much high high conviction names at this point. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I I mean we mentioned a couple like you know I'd certainly think Copart's a really good one, particularly because now their chief competitor is kind of put up the white flag. Uh, IAA agreed to be acquired by Ritchie Brothers, and I don't know whether that deal will happen or not. The Ritchie Brothers shareholders are revol- are re- rebelling. Mm-hmm. But you clearly have a wounded, distracted competitor that is at, I think, a structural disadvantage at this point that would take a lot of time and a lot of money, and it wouldn't even be certain that they could equal, you know, equalize Copart. So that's a good one. And Copart still, I mean, seems to get better with age um, as the network effects kind of take hold, and they still mm-hmm. have plenty of room to expand overseas. Uh, so that's that would be that would be one super clean balance sheet mm-hmm. and great team. I mean, really good capital allocators. This is a team, you know, they're, they're not paying any dividend. They're reinvesting everything. Mm-hmm. So um, very good compounder still. That is another great point that you brought up related to Copart. You um, mentioned some research that was done for Copart related to their competitor where the competitor was paying out dividends and Copart was keeping the money internally and reinvesting and the difference in their returns just like is astounding over time. So it goes to show, you know, the importance of great capital allocation. And, um, you know, if you have a great capital allocator at the helm, they're going to recognize that um, if you have a great business and you have reinvestment opportunities, then dividends aren't a great use of capital because that's money that could be used um, to deploy, you know, internally within the business. So I think that was right. also a really great point that, I think a lot of younger investors overlook, um, some mm-hmm. people get attracted to dividends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was one of the more controversial things that Thomas Phelps said in his book when he wrote that dividends are an expensive luxury. Um, uh, and it's just basic math. If you have a great business, you'd rather they take all the cash and keep reinvesting it. If they can, there's certainly a place for dividends. You don't want companies to just take the money and, and, invest in lower quality businesses mm-hmm. or blow it on stupid acquisitions and things. So there's definitely a place where eventually companies should pay a dividend. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're focused on these, looking for these big multi-baggers, then probably not going to be in a dividend pair. Now, sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, company might returns might be high enough where they could still pay half of their cash flow out of dividends and still compound really high. And there's rare bit, rarely, mm-hmm. but you'll find every once in a long, long while, you'll find a business that can grow without re- any reinvestment at all mm-hmm. and, and has very high returns. And, and so it's a math problem. You know, it's some combination of returns and reinvestment that you want to get mm-hmm. a, a good compounding number. Yeah. Tying that into two business we, businesses we've talked about, Berkshire, to my knowledge, never paid a dividend that I know of mm-hmm. anyways. And then Constellation right. Software. Um, they pay a small regular dividend and they were paying these special dividends when they had extra cash. And, um, I believe it was a couple of years ago, Leonard, um, released a letter stating that they're going to be discontinuing any special dividends, um, until they state otherwise, because they want to put that cash back into the business. And I think that's a great decision. How, um, one of the executives is like bugging Mark Leonard yeah. to discontinue these. And, um, he, eventually he comes around to agreeing with them and right. making that move. Right. I mean, if you're earning 30% and then you're returning and you have op- your opportunities to invest and get 25% return, but instead of taking that, you give it back to your shareholders, you know, shareholders would probably say, keep it and invest it in 25. That's still a really, really high, you know, return. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's a very, you know, it's a big positive that he came around on that. And yeah, it's another, mm-hmm. another feather in his cap, I suppose. We had talked about, um, Obviously, Constellation and Berkshire, 
And I, I view Mark Leonard just as this Buffett like character. If I were to spend this weekend just studying one company or one founder, um, that maybe you just really admire, or maybe even one investor, um, is there anyone that you have in mind that would be worth researching and maybe even me potentially covering on the show? Yeah. Well, you know, Willis Johnson and Copar has a great story. Is that book Junk to Gold? I definitely recommend that. Great story. Mm-hmm. And not, not as well known. Yeah. Uh, that would probably be the one I would go with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, Old Dominion also has a very good story because they're the Congdon family and it started back in the 30s with like a single truck lane. And they, there's also a book they have that tells their corporate story. Um, but in that case, it's not one executive per se. It's more of a the family over several generations but still an interesting case study. Awesome. Well, Chris, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. I really enjoyed it. Um, huge fan of your work and enjoy following you. So before we close it out, how can the audience get in touch with you and learn more about your book and your fund? Yeah, uh, well, I'm on Twitter. So uh, uh, it's at Chris W-M-A-Y-E-R. And I have a a uh, website, Woodlock House Family Capital. I have a blog I write occasionally. So uh, those are the two best places to find, find out more. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chris. All right. Thanks, Clay. Mark Leonard is a very interesting character. He's a billionaire, yet nobody really knows too much about him other than what he's put out in his shareholder letters. There's probably two or three photos of him that exist on the internet, and not a single interview is publicly available with him. 